science is always searching, learning unusual things about the commonplace, new things about the old, groping for more facts to add to the world's store of knowledge. Nothing is too old, too simple for scientists to experiment with in their research laboratory. For thousands of years, magnetism has been a phenomenon for study. Ages ago, learned men observed that certain rocks and metals had a peculiar, uncanny power of attraction for certain other metals. They called these natural magnets lodestones and attributed their power of attraction to some occult force. We are all familiar with a horseshoe magnet and its ability to pick up nails, needles, and similar objects. Few of us, however, know about this type of magnet, just a straight bar. And few also realize that magnets can repel as well as attract. Every magnet, you know, has two poles, each of opposite sign. When like poles are turned toward each other, the magnets push away from one another. When unlike poles are turned toward each other, their push becomes a pull. Now the bar magnet is placed between these glass pins, and it floats. Magic? No. There's a second bar magnet in the wooden base, and our bar magnet is held in suspension by the push exerted by the like poles of the two magnets. All magnets attract and repel, but only these magnets, made of an alloy of which the ancients never dreamed, are sufficiently strong to float in space. Here's an experiment made by Dr. Irving Langmuir, an experiment which represents the work which won for him the Nobel Award in Chemistry and which has helped produce an oil that provides proper lubrication even when sealed in airtight apparatus. The implements are simple indeed. A glass tray is filled with water and talcum powder is dusted over the surface, not to eliminate the shine, but to make the experiment visible. The bottle contains mineral oil, the same kind of oil that is used in your automobile. A drop of this oil placed on the water remains practically stationary. And the old adage that oil and water don't mix is true in this case. The second oil is mineral oil that has been heated, oxidized, cooked if you please. A drop of this oil on the same water spreads and spreads. We cannot see the thin film of oil which has shoved the talcum aside, but it is really there. And now for an oil which does spread, a vegetable oil. It fairly runs, leaps, because molecules of this vegetable oil have molecular feet, feet which have an affinity for water. And since we're discussing oil, here's some more information experimental research has disclosed. Engineers have spent years trying to eliminate vibration from rotating machinery. When this laboratory model was built, it became apparent that when oil flows through its bearing, the shaft whips more and more violently. The more oil, the more vibration. Although oil may calm the troubled waters, it gives this machine the jitter. The facts derived from a study of this apparatus are helping to solve some of the problems of vibration created by rotating machinery. Note that when the oil supply is turned off, the shivering stops.
seen this in many a jewelry store window. It's a radiometer, a set of light aluminum vanes inside a partially exhausted glass bulb. Each little vein is polished on one side and covered with lamp black on the other. When a lighted match is held close to the bulb, the veins revolve. This is because a shiny surface reflects light and a black surface absorbs it. The air next to the black surface is heated by the light from the match, exerting a pressure against the vein and causing it to revolve. These black sticks are selenium, a non-metallic element discovered by J.J. Berzelius in 1817. It is found in combination with many minerals, including sulfur, and is used to make selenium photocells, one of which you see being assembled. The metal disc has a small amount of selenium on one side. It is placed in a Bakelite holder, and then a strip of metal is placed on top to make an electrical contact, and the outer cover is screwed on. Watch the meter as the electric light bulb approaches the selenium disc. The more light, the greater the current. The less light, the weaker the current. The meter is an ammeter which registers electrical energy. Light alone provides the electrical power through the photocell. See, when a human hand shuts off the beam of light, the meter registers no current. The photocell is changing ordinary light into electrical energy. With, with three photocells collecting three times as much light, we'll now drive an electric motor, a small motor in size, to be sure, but completely equipped with field, poles, armature, brushes, and all the trimming. Put light on the photocells, and away spins the motor. Rather nice. An electric motor which runs on sunlight, daylight, gaslight, any kind of light, without any other fuel. Here's something to think about. Remove the light, or intercept it with some opaque object, and the motor gradually stops. A Jules Verne might imagine aeroplanes powered by beams of light and automobiles driven by light rays instead of gasoline. But today, it is merely a midget motor driven by light.